Hey everybody, welcome to Spiky Saturday number 242 on the Mandalik. I'm John as always, and we're going to do something a little bit different this week. We're not going to do Theros, it's old, it's tired, it's an awful format. I'm instead going to talk to you about Mystery Booster, because I did it last night, and it was absolutely amazing. So we're going to go to some draft recap from last night. I recorded the entire draft, we're going to go over every single pick, and then I'm going to talk to you about the deck that I ended up with and how the matches went. I was going to do this as a pre-release vlog style video with footage in between, music, etc., the, we'll talk about this later, but the night went kind of long, and so I just nixed that idea. So we're just going to do draft recap entirely, and then a quick talk. So let's go watch the draft. So we joined the draft already in process, where I had a foil Lich's Mirror as the foil, which I had price checked, which is why we're mid-pack here. Uh, and it was like $8, and then... Eh. $8 isn't that much money in one of these drafts. I really wanted to win the draft. I didn't want to just rare draft and end up with a bad deck. So I was really going between it and the Champion of the Parish that you saw in the pack as well. Champion of the Parish is just such a powerful card. There wasn't much else that I was considering in the pack, really. Jackal Pup if I wanted to go heavy mono red, but seems like a weak first pick in this. I really wanted to take that Champion of the Parish, but Lich's Horror seemed interesting. It was $8. When am I ever going to see another one? And I also didn't read that you have to shuffle your all of your permanents back into your library too, meaning that it's awful because your opponent who just beat you is now facing you with nothing on board. So anyways, into pack one, pick two, or yeah, pack one, pick two, We've got uh, uh, an Abzan Charm, which I'm kind of interested in there. A Yavimaya Elder, which isn't uh, too bad to start with. Shatter, of course, is awful. We've got a Great Pelt Refuge. Uh, I don't know if you want to pick lands too highly here. There's just good power. Glint Sleeve Artisan. Of course, I'm having to read a lot of these cards and uh, kind of remember how they do. Cartouche of Solidarity. The Cartouche cycles in this, and uh, the Cartouches are better than you might think they are if you didn't play original Amon Ket. Uh, looking here, we've got a Displace, which, of course, is doing amazing things in Popper Cube right now. Prodigal Sorcerer jumps out to me right away. I love me a Prodigal Sorcerer. There's an Annihilate as well. Five mana instant speed, unconditional-ish removal. But I go back to that Prodigal Sorcerer. Because, man, do I just love it. It gets to pick off all the X ones. Any like low curve aggro deck, I'm probably going to be able to ping a lot of stuff. And Prodigal Sorcerer can just be a bit of inevitability, just hitting the opponent uh, time after time after time. So I keep that Prodigal Sorcerer on the top. I think about the Annihilate, but I do take the Prodigal Sorcerer. Pack one, pick three, we join in progress a little bit as I'm reading Reality Scramble because boy, are there a lot of words on that card that don't make me really want to do it. And even now, watching the video as I'm re-recording this voiceover, I've just seen the word retrace. I didn't see that word the first 17 times that I read that. You can see there's an erratic explosion over there as well. We've got a universal solvent, a turn aside, white of precinct six. None of these are very good cards. You don't really want them in a thing. And then, hey, a foil marrow narrer, marrow narrer, which apparently is like 10 bucks, uh, or at least it was on face to face when I last checked it. Uh, Canadian prices, of course. I was curious because it looks like it should be a good card, except for the fact that there aren't that many rats in the set. There's some. There's some. I think there were at least two other rats in this pod but yeah it just doesn't do anything it's just a very expensive two three ultimately so i i, I wasn't a big fan of taking maronar here i i had to think about it a whole lot you see me doing some uh counting there of who knows what um but yeah i, I didn't take the maronar out of this pack either we've got an uncaged fury which of course if you wanted to be plain simple aggro you could take but there wasn't much in this pack. There was a horseshoe crab sitting there. I thought about horseshoe crab. I, I had a thought of it being good, but of course that's from uh, Ultimate Masters or Masters 25 where there was crab combo. There's an Inok Bondkin, which is a fine card. Forsake the worldly crop rotation to help for some fixing. Honestly, the only card that I'm even vaguely interested in this pack is this extract from darkness. Uh, to Each player mills two cards and then I get to put a creature onto the battlefield. I figure people are gonna have bombs in this format, right? Maybe I will, maybe they will. Will, so I take extract. Heading on into pack one, pick four, I think I want to head towards blue, but of course I think you're still super open at this point. And just based on the way the packs are with two of each color in the common and uncommon slots, um, I, I think you do want to stay open a little bit. We've got a Doom Gape here, which of course is a big scary creature if you can cast it. I, I'm currently not really those colors though. Uh, Mark of Mutiny, there's a Gaseous Form, a Deep Analysis. Deep Analysis is a totally fine card. It'd be better if it was instant, but oh well. Uh, we've got a Centaur Course or a Gruesome Fate. These are all filler cards. Exultant Sky Marcher was amazing in its format, an Eldrazi Devastator there, a Goblin Assault. There's honestly not too much going on in this pack either. Um, for as powerful as some of these packs can be, uh, I think we've seen some weakish ones here at the start. I take a look at Deep Analysis again just because it looks really good and I end up taking it. I, I like drawing cards. Why not, why not draw some cards? 
Next pack is here, and boy, in editing this video, can I see how slow our draft pod was. There was a three and a half minute gap between uh, that last pick and this one. We've got a Tectonic Edge here, a Feet of Defiance, which is a card I love. Nizumi Short Fang, I believe that is a foil. Yeah, that is a foil Nizumi Short Fang. I, of course, have to take a read at what these flip cards do, and boy, do flip cards suck for having to like flip them over to, to even be able to read what they're saying. Nizumi looks interesting. Um, we've got a Rivals Duel there, a uh, Convolute. Underworld Coinsmith is a card that I love in uh, sort of Pioneer uh, Chaos Drafts. Um, but this, of course, is much broader than Return to Ravnica to current. So flipping through, I, I just take the Nizumi Short Fang. It seems like a card that I could do some work with. Being able to make my opponent discard and potentially get in some non-combat damage uh, is just a nice little bit of thing. Pack one pick six time. We've got a Fester Creep on top there. Um, I have to reread what that was, and it's a fine card. We've got an Iron Tread, Iron Tread Crusher. Iron Tread Crusher, uh, which I had to reread for being such a simple card. Uh, Ephemeral Shields there, uh, Shape the Sands, Might of the Masses. Coveted Jewels, a card I've never seen before. It's a commander card, so why would I have? I have to give this a thorough reading to discover that no, in fact, it's not that good. There was a brief moment where I thought, ooh, maybe this is good, and then I saw the six mana casting cost. There's a Seltai Rune Mark, a Phantasmal Bear, a Shambling Remains. There's a War Gate, um, which is cute but not terribly exciting. Honestly, this pack doesn't really excite me either. This this feels like another pack without much power, so I take the Phantasmal Bear. I've already got a Prodigal Sorcerer, a Deep Analysis. I think I'm on blue, and a Phantasmal Bear is a fine card. Pack one, pick seven, coming your way. We've got Excavation Elephant, which of course is just not a good card. Uh, we've got Lash Knife Barrier, Oresco Swift Claw. I love Oresco Swift Claw. Never happened. Brazen Buccaneers. Hidden Stockpile. Boy, do I remember Hidden Stockpile being really good in Aether Revolt. Uh, Leapfrog, a Rush of Adrenaline. Just not much going on here. Um, I, I'm really honestly thinking about the Revolt um, just because it's such a good card. I look like I'm heading towards Blue Black which with what I've taken so far. And uh, I could splash white for the uh, uh, for the revolt there. There's a castaways, which you know it was good Nixalon, but I'm not going to have pirate swords or pirate cutlasses. So uh, yeah, I, I'm really just looking at that revolt there. And the hidden revolt is in fact what I take. You can see there's a lot of table talk going on here, which is part of the reason why this pod was so slow. Um, but yeah, I do just take this hidden stockpile. So we will just skip ahead to that. So with that hidden revolt or hidden stockpile being taken and uh, me thinking that I'm on my way to be being, being blue, black, splash, white, I get past a Dreadbringer Lamp Pads, which I have to give a reread, a Marsh Hulk as well. That is two black commons. That suggests that people aren't necessarily drafting black in the direction that's coming to me. There's a heavy infantry there, another Jackal Pup, which uh, or is actually, this would be the, the wheel. So that's the original Jackal Pup. Contraband Kingpin, of course, Kingpin, of course I'm in blue, black. It is a 1-4 lifelinker, even if I'm not playing many artifacts. Um, it's still a fine card. And honestly, about the only card that I'm terribly excited here, Dreadbringer Lamp Pads is okay, but not super exciting. I would take it if it came back around on a wheel. Um, but yeah, the, the packs honestly weren't that powerful in, in pack one, or at least not at the cards that I was seeing. So I am just going to take that Contraband Kingpin here because there's not much else in the pack. Next pack, here we are, pick nine, I believe. There's a Gift of Paradise, which I do briefly think about getting into green. Maybe I can just do five color. There's a Displace, which I'm already blue, and maybe I'll pick up some things that have good ETB effects on them. I don't currently have any, uh, but I guess they would trigger Revolt, so I do take the Displace. Next pack is here with uh, Reality Scramble still sitting in there. Turn aside, I think about turn aside. For some reason, reading the, the text made me think it was good, because of course, people target things, right? People target my stuff, but no, of course, of course, Displace is never terribly good. I pick up my pack here to uh, look through. I don't quite remember what I was looking through for. I don't know why I would bother looking through uh, for this pick here. Perhaps it was to see um, if I could untap anything with Horseshoe Crab, because for some reason, I got it into my head that that was how a Horseshoe Crab works. But I'm ultimately just going to take this Reality Scramble here. I don't think I'm going to play it, uh, but I don't think I'm going to play anything else in this pack. So I do just take the, uh, the, the crazy rare because maybe I'll find a place for it somewhere in the future. Next few picks should go relatively quick. I hope, if I remember correctly, we've got a Gruesome Fate, which is awful. And then we've got a Goblin Assault, which is not freely for me. A Centaur Course or a Mark of Mutiny, a Gaseous Form. Gaseous Form is not my favorite kind of removal because it does give your opponent an infinite blocker. But I guess if it was scary, at least it's not going to be attacking me anymore. 
Next pick is here, and hey, look at that, the Underworld Coinsmith is here. I do believe I'm going to go blue-black with a touch of white, and I like Underworld Coinsmith. Constellation is just a great ability, and if I can activate it even once a turn, it's going to be a decent bit of uh, bonus damage. Getting down into the dregs here, we've got ourselves a Shambling Remains and Ephemeral Shields and a Shape of the Sands. None of these are cards that I'm going to play, so I just take the, uh, take the gold card. Second last pick, here we are with two cards that don't matter, Never Happened and Lash Knife Barrier. We take the Never Happened because I'm definitely in black, I'm pretty sure. And hey, it could be a fine sideboard card if my opponent has like a big bomb or something that I just cannot deal with. Last pick, I'm going to get myself the Dreadbringer Lamp Pads. Woohoo, I might actually play that. So time for pack two to open up. Pack two, pick one here. I see a Braid of Fire foil in the back, a Caravex Torch. Uh, I was certain I was playing blue, black, white at this point, but that Caravex Torch is going to make me think differently. So Soul Strike Technique, Champions of Ereshin, neither of these white cards are really worth anything. Failed Inspection, Strategic Planning in blue, okay cards, but not exciting. Scourge and Queen's Agent, uh, Thrill, just nothing in colors that I want. I'm not playing green, a Simic Locket, whatever. And yeah, Caravex Torch, just a super good card. It's basically Banefire, a little bit worse. The foil's Braid of Fire. Uh, I don't know why I didn't read Braid of Fire more carefully. Uh, and you can see I slammed that torch. A, Braid of Fire apparently is worth like $14 in foil right now. And B, I for some reason thought it was like a, a, a ritual or something, like Pyretic Ritual or, or, you know, one of those storm cards that's just not playable and limited. It's not. It's basically just extra mana all of the time. So uh, maybe I should have taken that. Um, honestly, I don't think so. Not against Caravex Torch. Um, Caravex Torch is just super, super good. So with a slight chink in the blue, white, black armor with that red Caravix torch, I get the next pack that has a Charging Monstrosaur, an Iron Mirror, a Goblin Charbelcher, and a Greater Gargadon all on top. Um, all of these pretty decent red cards. I have to give Goblin Charbelcher a thorough reading over here. Uh, I've honestly never really come across the card. I'm well aware that it's a huge archetype in Legacy, maybe Vintage, maybe Modern, who the heck knows. Um, but I didn't exactly know what the card did. Did. Reading it over, reading it over a few times, I realized that this is the kind of card that will trick people into taking it because they'll think about the times that it could do like 20 damage and they won't think about the times that it can do literal actual zero damage. I keep it on top because I get a little bit tempted by it. There's a Bastion Inventor there. There's a Condescend. There was some uh, more blue-red good cards in there. There was a lot of red, good red stuff. Evan Carr's Justice back there doing amazing work in the MTGO Popper Cube. I take another look at this Goblin Charbelcher, give it another read over, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm in a blue-black-white deck, and I might splash red for Caravix Torch, so I'm probably not ever going to hit the mountain. I do ultimately decide, you know what, let's take this Charbelcher, and uh, maybe we can just get some random damage. If I be like a black-blue controlly deck, you know, Charbelcher doing two, three, four damage two, three, four times over the course of the game could be great. Pack two, pick three, we've got Goblin Game on top, a card that of course is very cute, but that I don't want to play. Uh, we've got a couple of green cards here, a couple of red cards that are all sort of filler. Costly Plunder, Dark Blast are the black cards that I'm looking at. Dark Blast looks okay. There's a Dazzling Lights, Ninetale, White Fox, I've never seen it before, but holy moly, it's basically Ophidian for three mana. Uh, really good looking Ninetale, White Fox there. Easy slam for me. Definitely going into this blue, black, white deck. Splash, red and using Char Belcher. Pack two pick four time. We've got ourselves an Ash Baron, which, uh, you know, technically fixes. Crenellated Wall, a card that I've never seen before, and I have to read a few times because it just seemed f fine. An 0-4 for four that could become an 0-8 or could make anything else plus 0 plus 4 seemed okay if you were going to be very controlling. But then there's a Mana War that got past me. I, I barely even look at the rest of the pack. I briefly see the Chandra's Revolution there. And boy, I just take that Mana War because holy moly, another amazing three drop in blue. Give me... So pack two, pick five, it was around this time that I started to remember or started to realize that I hadn't taken a playable black card since possibly pack one, pick four with Nizumi uh, Cutthroat and Nizumi Shortfang. Um, and maybe I'm not actually black at all. There's a Fire and Ice in this pack, which I, of course, put right up to the top. Underneath that is a Moment of Craving, which is a very good playable black card that may suggest that black could be a little bit open, but I just haven't seen anything. But boy, have I seen blue and red. So I take that Fire and Ice because it's just a super solid card. 
pretty big weight for this pick here, and there's an Assemble the Legion on top, and holy moly is Assemble the Legion a very good card that we're getting, uh, I believe, fifth pick here? Um, that's kind of nutty. I have to read Serrated Arrows, because of course Serrated Arrows is a totally fine card. Uh, Prowling Pangolin, a Catacomb Crocodile, none of these cards are very good. Honestly, it looks like the black cards just weren't good in our pod. Uh, there's a Laboratory Brute, Stoic uh, Builder, Beetleback Chief, which is fine if I was in red, and I should have realized that I was starting to really get into red at this point. I don't think I, I, I knew I was getting out of black. I don't quite think I realized that I was getting into red. Um, but yeah, Assemble the Legion is just really good. I was already thinking of splashing white anyways. I do have to think about the serrated arrows there again because, you know, maybe it's risky switching colors this late to become a blue-red-white deck when I was going to be a blue-black white deck. Um, I, I guess it's not a huge change, and I do have that Caravix Torch. So I, I take the Assemble the Legion. Honestly, that should have been a much faster slam dunk. Um, but yeah, I, I now have a very good bomb, a second good bomb, I would say, with Caravix Torch. Pack two picks, six time. We've got a Sidraxis Spectre sitting here, which I have to take a look at. Although at this point, I know I'm out of black. Um, I, and I know I want to splash red in my blue deck, or uh, white in my blue deck, so I don't really think about taking it. Memory Lapse, I see a two mana counter spell, and I get a little bit excited until I realize that it just goes on top of the player's uh, library instead of in the graveyard, so it's not that good. Mutiny is an okay card. I'm going to put that to the front. Molten Rain, uh, three mana land destruction. That's about as cheap as we get it. It goes to the front too. And then, hey, a Wretched Griff. I I know I'm blue. I know Wretched Griff is an amazing card. Uh, this Wretched Griff is an easy pick here. Next pack luckily had a much shorter lag time. We've got a failed inspection, a Voldaren Duelist, a strategic planning, a thrill of possibility. Those all get pushed to the front. It's at this point that I think I realize, you know what, I actually think I am blue red here. Um, thrill of possibility and strategic planning are both going to give me card selection and I really take a long think about which one I want to take here. Ultimately the thrill of possibility is going to win due to the instant speed nature of it um, over the strategic planning Voldaren Duelist certainly isn't going to do it. Failed inspection I do also briefly think about but we do just take that thrill of possibility. Next pack already here we've got Maverick Thopterus still in the pack. Blue red must be wide open. Iron Mirror as well is going to get pushed to the front here a little bit. Bastion Adventure I take another quick look at that remembering it has hexproof this could be scary if i could do auras or something but maverick thopterist is just too good and we are going to pop that into the deck easily next pack we've got dark blast still in the pack people definitely aren't playing black i don't think it's not an amazing card um, but at this point i am i have made the decision that i'm blue red and i'm going to splash white for that assemble the legion there's a dazzling lights it might make the deck Getting late into pack two here, we get the next pick, and we've got uh, Refocus, which isn't very good, but it cycles sort of, I guess, and then Crenelated Wall, which honestly, if my plan is to go late and ping people with Prodigal Sorcerers and find my planes and play Assemble the Legion or do a big Caravix Torch or Char Belcher a bunch of times, what better than an O4 wall that makes something else into a better than an O4 wall? just seems like the correct pick here if my plan is to go late to those bombs, so I do just take that crenellated wall. Fourth last pick here, we've got a Dream Twist, a Raptor Buddy, and a Madcap Skills and a Shambling Goblin. Not much here. I know I'm in blue-red and I've got two choices. I don't think I'm going to play either of these cards, although if I do end up with anything that looks kind of like an aggro creature, then Madcap Skills could be worth it. it. It's a pretty good card. It was a decent card in its set that it was in, so I do just take the Madcap Skills here. Third last pick, we've got an Active Trees and a Laboratory Brute and a Stoic Builder. Again, I'm going to be looking at the blue and red cards here. Neither of them really work for me. Active Treason is just not a card that my deck wants, but I don't want a Laboratory Brute either, so I do take that Act of Treason. Into the dregs, we've got two white cards that I'm not going to play. Acrobatic Maneuver, I decide to take because I don't want anybody doing any end of the battlefield kind of shenanigans. And then finally, a Queen's Agent last pick, which I'm also not going to play. So at this point, we've taken a long meandering path. We've been blue-black into blue-black-white into blue-black-white-red into blue-red-white is where we're going to finally end up here. Pack three, I've got a Spawning Grounds and a Rith and uh, just kind of a, a bunch of cards that I'm not super excited about really spawning grounds I, i'm not going to splash green for it we've got a balduvian rage which i guess is cute but boy does it not do exactly what you want it to do it doesn't give things trample the white cards are not exciting for me to splash the blue cards there's a metallic rebuke i guess there's a ruin rat and a phyrexian rager finally some okay black cards red's not that great there's a fling a naturalized bristling boar we've got a ruinous blast a crystal chimes uh and rith the awakener there's just not 
anything that I really want out of this pack. I guess I kind of want the Metallic Rebuke, but I'm 99% confident that it will come back to me in an eight-man pod especially and in a, a seven-person pod, I think for sure. So I'm just going to take the Rith, the Awakener here just to have a legendary dragon, I guess, that I'm not going to play. Now it's around here where the video cuts out actually. It looks like we do have one more pick here so we can take a look at it. We see Jushi the uh, uh, Jushi Apprentice in this pack along with an Alchemist Refugion foil which I think is also like $8 and I wasn't aware and honestly I don't care. The, the foil prices are going to go down quite a bit. And yes, it does cut out there. So I do take that Jushi Apprentice. Here's some footage that I took when I was gonna make this into a vlog style. To quickly go over the rest of the draft before we get into the match recap, I do end up taking a Nin the Pain Artist, a Gelectrode, a Hypothesis, a Ghost Ship, and Flame Shot to confirm that, boy, howdy, am I ever in blue-red and did I correctly read this draft? I also pick up a Dual Shot, because why not? A Milliken, because I thought it actually fixed my mana, and that Metallic Rebuke did come back around. And there you got to see a brief glimpse of the new Gamers Emporium, which you'll see when we do actually do a pre-release recap. So after that comically messy draft, or at least the start of that comically messy draft, I ended up with a deck that was ultimately sort of blue-red, uh, ping you to death with alternate ways of killing you with the torch or with legion or with something like that. Uh, I'm actually going to go over every card in the deck, some more quickly than others, uh, because I think that's kind of the best way to talk about Mystery Booster, because of course Mystery Booster is really about each of the cards because there's no archetype. So let's start off with the one drop slot. First up we had Phantasmal Bear, because um, it was a 2-2 for one. And if somebody wants to use removal on it, although they may, they don't have to use removal, they could use any sort of uh, uh, targeting to kill it, it was still really early interaction. Phantasmal Bear is honestly just a really good card. I enjoy it in most draft formats. It's not a premium card at all, but it made the deck. We had a dual shot, which uh, at first I thought dealt uh, divided, or, or I could do two to one or one to two. Uh, it can only do one to two. That caught me up one time. Um, but really helped another time. And there was a Dazzling Lights just for some quick interaction. I guess the green screen's actually messing with some of these cards. Let's maybe hold them a little bit closer. That's still green screened. Um, so yeah, Dazzling Lights was just a way to last a little bit longer and get me some good card selection with the Surveil card selection ultimately really helped this deck out quite a bit. Up next, let's look at the two drop slot, starting with the creatures. We had a Milliken in the two drop slot in part because I wanted to fix my mana for the Assemble the Legion. This card doesn't make colored mana. It only makes colorless mana. I, I saw that and decided to keep it in anyways, because, you know, ramping up to assemble the Legion on four is still going to be really good. I'm still going to find that white mana and just extra mana for the torch and things like that. It was an okay card. Ultimately, I never actually cast it. I also had Jushi Apprentice in the deck. Jushi Apprentice, ultimately I was only using it for the first side. I never flipped it. Flipping it's just not really that big of a deal. Target player draws X cards where X is the number of cards in your hand is not a big deal. I had one chance where I could have put in mana and cast a spell and had nine cards in my hand. Honestly, it just wasn't worth it. But paying three mana to draw a card every turn? That's fantastic. Jushi was great. I had Nin the Pain Artist. Nin the Pain Artist seemed pretty darn good. Uh, blue, red, and X to deal damage to something, and the controller pays X or draws X cards. Obviously, I'm going to be doing that to myself. I can hit my ghost ship or something for three, draw three cards, still keep my ghost ship, and if, you know, worse comes to worse, or if it was the final move of the game, I could just kill their blocker. If I wanted to, they would draw some cards, but... I would win the game. Uh, we had a Fire and Ice because, of course, Fire and Ice is just a very good card. Drawing cards, dealing damage, your choice. Fire does let you do two or one and one. And Thrill of Possibility, just for some more card selection. You, you guys know Thrill. We've had Thrill a lot in the past few sets. It just helped me draw some cards. Over in the three drop slot, creature wise, we had uh, mostly creatures. Up first was Ninetale White Fox which is from the Global series. I hadn't actually seen that set symbol before. Um, this card is just a Fidian. It's obviously a little bit less good than a Fidian, but three mana for a 2-2 that draws a card every single time it deals combat damage to a player. A plus, solid card. Played it a fair bit, helped out quite a bit. We had Tim, some do call him Tim, Prodigal Sorcerer, the original Prodigal Sorcerer with new art. Uh, deals the damage, kills off X1s, kills off things after combat, or my plan, just hit my opponent for one. 
three, four, five times. We had a Mana War that was passed to me pretty late. Mana War, of course, is just a fantastic card, and it was a fantastic card. Three mana, two, two that bounces. We had Gelectrode, which I think would have been an amazing card as well. I wonder why these cards don't look as good on the camera. That's why I have the, uh, the better version over there. It's just not focusing on them, I guess. Perhaps I have autofocus turned off. I checked, I don't have autofocus turned off. Yeah, Gelectro, deal with damage to any target. Awesome, it's just like Tim, except every time I ha cast an instant sorcery, I can untap it. It's gonna be even more ping damage to my opponent's face. Unfortunately, I never drew it or cast it. Metallic Rebuke, just a counterspell, just a bad version of Mana Leak. I, I was probably not going to improvise it at all, um, but it counterspells. It's not going to counter everything if your opponent has a ton of mana, but it's going to counter a fair number of things. Over in the four drop slot, we had two whole creatures. Ghost Ship, a 2-4 flyer blocks a whole lot of things for four mana, plus blue, blue, blue to regenerate means it blocks everything and lives. We had Crenolated Wall. I'll have to look up what crenelated means. Crenelated wall, I figured it's a wall, plus it taps to make something else into basically a wall. Plus O plus four, heck, it can block and then tap itself and become an O8 blocker. It was a way for me to just live long enough to cast my torch, cast my legion, cast my charbelcher, etc. It was a way to not die, essentially. Could have been a better card for sure. We had flame shot, uh, four mana to sorcery speed, as I learned. Uh, deal three damage divided as I choose among number of target creatures is uh, still okay, even though it's sorcery speed. But man, discarding a mountain to play it for free is really, really good. Uh, we had deep analysis because, hey, drawing two cards at sorcery speed for four mana is totally fine, especially when you can do it again for two mana and three life. And then we had Charbelcher, which uh, I figured this, this I think was one of the cards that started me down the path of let's just hit my opponent for damage that's not combat damage. I never got to cast Charbelcher. It was, I was so excited to play it. I was so excited to, uh, you know, just every turn be paying three and flipping cards and doing random amounts of damage, doing potentially zero or potentially, I don't know, like 72 damage. I don't think you could possibly do 72 damage, but yeah, I never got to cast it, which is very unfortunate. Uh, in the five plus drop spot, we had two more creatures. We had Maverick Thopterus because of course a five mana two two with two one one flyers is fantastic. We had a Wretched Griff, which sure costs seven mana if you hard cast it, but it can cost blue if you sack a five drop. I was typically sacking my mana war, so I was playing mana war, um, bouncing a creature. Next turn, my Wretched Griff cost me three mana for a three four flyer that draws a card. A plus. I'm so happy to play with Wretched Griff again. Moving into the spells, we had Hypothesizzle because it's an amazing name. How could you not play it? And four damage to uh, target creatures. Fantastic. Plus the, uh, the the draw two cards, discard one. Perfect. Uh, I was saying Crovax's Torch. It's actually Caravex Care Torch. Caravex Torch way back from Mirage. It's uh, not quite as good as Banefire. Banefire makes it look a little bit worse, uh, but it's still absolutely fantastic and can finish games. And of course, finally, Assemble the Legion. The card I picked up originally to splash back when I was a black-white deck. And here I am in my red-blue deck splashing white. Assemble the Legion, of course, is just an absolute insane bomb. Every time I cast it, I won the game. It's in, it's not impossible to lose the game when you play it, but it's a super, super, super good card. And it won me some games. So moving on into the matches, round one, I got the buy. We had 14 people, which means we did two pods of seven. We do not do cross pod pairing because that is awful. And so that means with two pods of seven, somebody gets a buy. And I got the round one buy, which was unfortunate because the draft went really long. The draft took 45 minutes. A lot of people reading all the cards because they were new to them. Uh, a lot of table talk. Uh, our, our draft pod, our pod specifically, took a long time to draft. And then deck building, it was already an hour into it. And here I was with a buy to sit around for another hour. And of course, a match did go to time and went to turns. So it was a long time before I finally got to play my first match, but I had a win. I was 1-0. I was undefeated. I crushed that by round two. I was up against Joel. Uh, didn't know what he was playing. I shuffle up. I keep a hand that was a little bit slow, but it had some really good cards in it. And he went Gravedigger, Jackal Pup, some sort of 2-2, a morph. And I was dead on turn five. 
I was dead. I think I played one card that game, maybe two cards. Absolutely murdered. Uh, game two, I had uh, a faster hand, stuff that I knew could get in front of his stuff. He proceeded to mull to at least six. I don't think he went to five, I think he went to six, and uh, got stuck on black. It took him, I think, four turns to play something, maybe five turns, at which point I had just established not threats, but I had established the ability to draw a lot of cards with Jushi Apprentice and things like that. Um, eventually, I was pinging him with Prodigal Sorcerer, getting some damage in here or there. He started to establish a board, and then I Caravex torched him for nine. And uh, that was that was, that was him dying. Uh, game three, he had, again, not a fast start. He didn't have a one drop. And I think basically as long as he didn't have a one drop, I was going to be okay-ish in that matchup. Didn't have a one drop. I got Jushi down again. Man of War to bounce something. He had Serrated Arrows that he spread out uh, instead of killing Jushi Apprentice, which I think might have been a mistake because that drew me a whole lot of cards. Eventually, I got Assemble the Legion out. Just kept getting damage. And I had Caravex Torch sitting in my hand. I don't think I had it at the start of the game, but I had it real early, and uh, I caravexed him for 10 in that game and uh, killed him there. So I was 2-0. and oh. Luckily, in a small pod, we had two 2-0s. Two we knew who was going to play round three. It was going to be me and Jack. So we started playing our match right away before round two had ended um, so that we could actually get out of there at a reasonable time. I did not want to stay there till 11. So I went after round three. Me and Jack undefeated, both of us. And uh, Jack was on a blue-black, uh, seemed like a very controlling deck. Uh, I believe I had heard him say that he had picked up basically every piece of black removal he could find. Uh, I know he had certain death and I know he had uh, a couple of the kill target non-black creature cards a lot of like doom blade effects things like that just a lot of controlling stuff uh, game one he got out um, some cards <laughs> he got out fog walker he got out something else I don't remember exactly what cards he had um, but I got her to assemble the legion and it kind of didn't matter too much anymore. And Assemble the Legion crushed him pretty fast in game one. Game two, I think, was a little bit closer. He had some flyers going on that were a little bit of a problem until I got my ghost ship. Um, as well, he had the Harpy that you can pay one and a black and give attacking creatures minus one, minus one, which was basically an answer to Assemble the Legion if I was going to find it. And I had it in hand. So uh, I had to Caravex Torch the one, two Harpy to make sure that my Assemble the Legions friends could get through, played Assemble the Legions after he had tapped out because I smelled a counterspell. Uh, Assemble the Legions resolved, and I think it was maybe three turns later, four turns later, something like 10 soldiers just charged on in and finished him off. So I finished 3-0. 3-0 losing a single game. I had a buy to help me out, which was definitely big. Uh, but yeah, 3-0, three packs. I opened one pack just to see what I could get. I didn't get much. I think I got like got a tinker which is the card that stands out in my head but i don't even think that's worth that much people were opening crazy value out of these packs i sure as heck didn't but other people were opening crazy value but yeah it was super fun it was so much fun three and owing a draft proving to myself that i don't suck at magic i just suck at theros was really really nice uh, i want to draft this forever i've got two boxes on their way that i pre-ordered um i'm gonna see if i can do some sort of content for that i don't know if i can still do live stream drafts i got a new camera a new setup i'm gonna have to test out if it still works um and find people and find time to do it but i want to draft this format a ton i can't believe it's not an mtgo i think that's a massive miss i don't want to play cube i don't want to play you know crap small set chaos draft i want to draft this i want to draft mystery booster but yeah let me know how your mystery booster went if you just finally did it in stores if you've been doing it in conventions for a while let me know we're going to start doing crack a pack tuesdays or that's not what they're called anymore pack one pick ones with mystery boosters starting next week and we're, i think we're going to do mystery boosters straight through to the set review for Acoria. so stay tuned for that but i love this set i'm going to hopefully produce some more content with it maybe i'll do these draft recaps every week in addition to spiky saturday i guess we finally have to go back to theros next week um maybe i'll just do one of these each week as well if i keep going to the store if the store stays open with all of the stuff that's happening around. Um, yeah, let me know how it went. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can always find me over on Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. You can find me at patreon.com slash if you want to become a backer there. Uh, if you do become a backer at the $5 level or above, you get your chance to get the pack one pick one tuesday cards um I, I choose a random patron at the five dollar level or above each week if you hit sixty dollars lifetime you get a mana leak play mat and i am looking into other bonuses as well stay tuned 
at some point in the future. Um, you can always like, share, and subscribe. That's the easiest way. Uh, and thanks for watching, everybody. Let me know whatever you want to let me know, and I'll see you all next time.